Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Gibbs, for being with us today. Um, Dr. Gibbs is a clinical neuropsychologist at Tier Memorial Hermann um, Hospital in Houston, Texas. And today he will be um, giving us a little more information on managing uh, some challenging behaviors with uh, children and adolescents with a brain injury. So thank you again so much, Dr. Gibbs, for being here. I will go ahead and mute myself and let you take it away. Okay, that sounds great. Well, I'm very happy to be here with you all this evening. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, strategies for managing behavior, behavioral problems and children and adolescents with brain injury. And uh, so we're gonna go through and we'll talk about some basic behavioral principles um, to help really understand sort of, you know, hopefully why these uh, strategies, behavior modification strategies are useful. <clears throat> and then hopefully you'll be able to um, apply those strategies uh, with, uh, with the person that, that you know with a brain injury. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the importance of context in supporting behavior, especially for adolescents. Um, and uh, focus on two to three antecedent strategies that can uh, prevent behavior problems from happening in the first place. There's more information about me than you needed. Well, let's get through that. So first off, let's just talk a little bit about why, uh, why do children misbehave? So when we think about behavior, uh, behavioral problems, there are three things that we know for sure. So behavior is functional. So whatever the behavior is, um, the problematic behavior, it's serving some function for the child. Uh, you know, it could be um, attention seeking uh, for sure. It could be um, avoiding something that they do not want to do. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that children uh, may, mis may misbehave, but we always have to understand that there's some function behind it. We, we can also understand that behavior is predictable. So there may be certain um, situations or triggers or uh, you know things that can help us sort of understand when this behavior is going to happen, when it's most likely to happen. And then finally, we know the behavior is changeable. So um, we can apply some basic principles and hopefully modify some of the behavior problems that um, we're having to deal with. So when we think about um, you know, why do children, especially children with traumatic brain injury, why are they likely to, um, you know, more likely to have behavior problems? Well, we understand that, um, you know, many areas of the brain are responsible for helping us uh, control and manage our behavior. And so, uh, you know, if a person has an injury to the orbital frontal area, they're more likely to be, so an orbital frontal really is a sort of like, right? Um, behind your forehead, over your eyes, um, they're more likely to experience some impulsivity, be a little disinhibited, um, you know, maybe say things that they wouldn't typically say, that kind of thing. So the dorsolateral, or basically that means the side of the frontal lobes, um, and then the mesial, which means the middle of the frontal lobes, persons who have injuries to those areas may have difficulty initiating or just getting started. You know, they may sit there and not do anything, not because they don't want to do anything, but they have difficulty doing something without a prompt. Ventromedial prefrontal injury. So here we're looking at um, sort of upper uh, frontal lobe in the middle, uh, inefficient learning from consequences. So there may be some difficulty um, you know, with making the same mistakes over and over again, because they're not really responding as well uh, to consequences or, or the consequences aren't as meaningful um, and it's harder for them to learn from the consequences. Dorsolateral um, or mesial prefrontal, impaired working memory, uh, or just being able to hold multiple considerations before acting. So um, just too much information at a time can be overwhelming and difficult uh, for the person with brain injury to manage. And finally, hippocampal injury. We understand that the hippocampus, uh, which is deep down in the medial temporal lobe, um, is an important structure for memory. Um, so there may be impaired declarative memory or conscious recollection. There can be inefficient learning from consequences once again and that kind of thing. And so 
Certainly there are a variety of uh, structures um, or areas of the brain that can have a significant impact on our behavioral presentation if those areas are injured. And oftentimes it's not just one specific area in, in traumatic brain injury, it can be multiple areas um, and the connections between multiple areas. So it can, it can be pretty complicated. So what are some of the sort of psychosocial reasons that a, a person with traumatic brain injury may misbehave? Well, oftentimes there's going to be more learning difficulties uh, with a person who has a brain injury. And so that can be very frustrating. Uh, it can result in um, acting out or disengaging from learning activities in school. Social difficulties. So, you know, if somebody's, you know, personality has changed, they're more impulsive, um, irritable, those kinds of things that can interfere with, with peer relationships language problems. So, you know, be, having difficulty sort of comprehending or understanding uh, what people are saying, or oftentimes difficulty expressing, uh, expressing yourself, being able to find the words that are necessary to say what you're trying to convey, um, uh, being able to uh, produce speech in a meaningful way, that kind of thing can, can cause frustration for sure. Family problems and support. So, you know, everybody knows that when a family member has a, a traumatic brain injury, it does it puts a lot of stress on the family system, um, and you know there's a lot of demands on the caretakers, and and that can also cause some frustration and difficulty in the home. Emotional problems. So we understand that persons with brain injury are more likely are, are more susceptible to developing um, depression, anxiety, and that kind of thing. If a child had any pre-existing difficulty, so for instance, if the if a child had ADHD, then those uh, pre-existing problems are likely to be worse. You're going to have, uh, you know, the ADHD is going to be more prominent uh, and, and exaggerated in that regard. And then a lack of appropriate supports in the classroom. So if uh, if the school system does not understand the child's difficulties, then um, you know, they're not going to be able to provide them the appropriate support services, and then, you know, the student will, uh, the student with brain injury will be much more likely then to um, feel frustrated and have behavioral problems and that kind of thing, just because, you know, they're not able to meet the demands that are being asked of them. So, we're going to move now to talking about um, behavior management and just some basic uh, treatment and principle ideas related to behavior management. And these can be uh, um, helpful in understanding how to respond to behavior, uh, why behavior might occur, um, and hopefully how to more appropriately support behavior uh, moving forward. So, when we think about behavioral treatments, we're talking, we're thinking about a few different things. So one of them is environmental control. So you know, we're, there oftentimes there needs to be some structure, um, consistent uh, support and guidance and that kind of thing, um, you know, to help improve behavioral expectations, to set limits, um, and then increasing structure and routine. So if the environment is set up in that way then that can really help manage um, a, a lot of behavioral issues. There are also what are referred to as conting contingency management strategies. And so these are like reward systems to improve motivation. Um, and so, you know, basically what we're using here is uh, we're trying to look at the ABC, sort of the antecedents, the behaviors, and the consequences of the behavior. So what occurs, um, you know, what is sort of going on at the time of the misbehavior? What is that misbehavior? And then what is the result of that misbehavior? And if we can understand that, then that helps us get a much better framework for what's going on and, and how we can intervene. So some of the behavioral principles that are, are very important are, you know, we, we think about reinforcement or, um, you know, having a behavior occur more frequently. So a good behavior, for instance, there's, there's punishment, which has the uh, goal of reducing uh, you know, problem behaviors. There are reinforcement schedules. So how often and how do we reinforce good behavior? Um, once a good behavior is established, we can start uh, you know, not reinforcing as often and sort of uh, do the extinction of the reinforcement so that behavior is able to just occur on its own without us having to reward it. 
And then of course, over learning is basically just, you know, being sure that whatever the skill is, that that's being practiced and repeated um, consistently until until the uh, the child or adolescent has acquired it sufficiently and, and are doing it independently. So let's talk a little bit about reinforcement. So as I was saying, reinforcement increases the likelihood of a future behavior. So um, there are two uh, primary types of reinforcement. One is positive reinforcement, and that increases a desired future behavior by adding a stimulus. So like a reward, for instance. Um, so you know, we're, in, we're increasing the likelihood of seeing that behavior again by rewarding it. Negative reinforcement, also increases a behavior, but you're increasing a behavior by removing um, some sort of stimulus. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like uh, in a couple of slides to come. Once again, punishment is just decreasing uh, future behavior. So there's positive uh, punishment, which means decreasing a future behavior by adding an aversive stimulus. Um, you know, so that could be, so for instance, removal of privileges, for instance, that would be the aversive stimulus. Negative punishment decreases the future behavior um, by removing a, a stimulus. So that would be, um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, taking away something that might, um, that might be, uh, that the person might enjoy, or you kind of, you know, you just sort of lose that, um, lose that privilege. Then there are different, there's differential reinforcement. And so this applies both positive and negative reinforcement to promote whatever behavior we're looking at. It uses contrast effect to increase reinforcement value. So for example, um, you know, giving a specific positive attention, for instance, praise to desired behaviors. So that's positive reinforcement. Withdrawing attention or actively ignoring unwanted behaviors that's negative reinforcement. And so that's, you know, sort of the crux of, of what we're talking about here um, is, you know, trying to increase the behavior that we want to see and decrease the behavior um, that, you know, the more, the, and by doing that, decreasing the more problematic behavior. So here's a, an example of positive reinforcement. So um, they give you a lot of treats uh, while they're training you. So play dumb for as long as you can. So this, this uh, you know, they've worked the system here, but that, you know, that basically in a nutshell is what positive reinforcement is. You're giving a, in this situation, you know, you give, uh, you're giving a treat uh, uh, to the dog when they do some kind of behavior that, uh, you know, you're trying to reinforce uh, sitting or uh, speaking, whatever it might be. Um, and so that's positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement, uh, this is a great example of that. So for every day that your math grades stay below a B, your father will post a video of himself on YouTube. So in that case, the, the student is going to be very motivated to uh, get a better grade because she does not want to have to deal with the embarrassment of her dad posting uh, you know, humiliating videos on YouTube. And so you're gonna, she's gonna, you're gonna remove that stimulus to increase her behavior, uh, that, you know, to increase the positive behavior, which in this case is making me great. So whenever we're, we're, we are reinforcing, we need to think about you know, how are we going to reinforce? So there's continuous reinforcement, which basically is, you know, every time you see the behavior that you're looking for, you reinforce. Then there's intermittent reinforcement. So you, uh, you know, you're giving um, like a fixed interval, like every, every five minutes, you know, you give a, a reinforcement. Variable interval, you know, you just kind of, uh, it's not consistent the amount of time, but you you know you're rewarding like maybe uh, after one minute, then maybe two and a half minutes later, and, and so forth. Then there's ratio, so you know you reinforce every fourth positive behavior, for instance. Um, variable ratio would be um, you, you just kind of mixing it up, you know, you just sort of you know you'll give a reinforcement after two uh, demonstrations of behavior, then maybe after six, and then maybe seven, and then. 10 or that kind of thing. And so that's what variable ratio is. Out of all of these, variable ratio seems to be the most reinforcing. Um, it's, off, it's actually the kind of reinforcement that persons get when they're like gambling or that kind of thing. It's a variable ratio kind of a, a process there. So that can be um, most reinforcing. But I think that the 
important thing that we want to remember is when we're trying to get a child to acquire a new skill, you know, whatever that might be, um, we want to use continuous reinforcement uh, because until we're pretty sure that they have acquired that skill, and then we can go into more of a variable type of uh, um, reinforcement, and then eventually we can sort of fade or, or put that reinforcement under extinction. So once they're demonstrating that behavior routinely without getting the reinforcement. So um, we definitely, um, you know, we want to be sure that you know, we don't want to have to reinforce the child for every single thing for forever, obviously. So once again, once that behavior is mastered, you want to fade the uh, reinforcement. And then you want to put your attention on a new behavior that you're trying, trying to modify. So reinforcement to promote overlearning. So, um, you know, for overlearning, you want to emphasize sort of high frequency behavior demand. So something that's going to occur, you know, fairly, fairly uh, often. Um, we might want to model or demonstrate how, you know, what we're looking for and then have little rehearsals or practice of that provide continuous reinforcement for the target behaviors, provide intermittent reinforcement for already mastered behaviors. Um, we can utilize tangible reinforcers with like a token reward system, um, which many of you are probably familiar with, um, or just using prizes to increase motivation for, uh, for demonstrating the behavior. So one of the things, um, that I think is important to, to remember is, you know, we're trying to reinforce positive behaviors. Um, and sometimes the, the child's desire to demonstrate, a, a, you know, whatever behavior we're looking for may be very low. You know, internally, they don't have sort of that internal intrinsic motivation to do it. So by providing a reward stimulus, we're then giving them Hopefully, if we're using the right reward or reward type, we're giving them some motivation um, to external motivation to, to demonstrate that behavior. So foundations for promoting behavioral change. So, um, and we're going to talk more about sort of the, the traditional model or model that's used for very specific behavior problems and, and often for behavior problems in uh, younger children. Um, but I, I like this quote a lot here. Um, and so basically, a failure to understand how a child's typical behaviors reflect his disability can result in misperceptions such as viewing the child as non-compliant, willfully stubborn, or unmotivated, rather than confused, involved in a repetitive routine, or focusing on less relevant aspects of the situation. So um, you know, if we, a better understanding of the child's behavior, then will help us understand what that, you know, uh, understand that behavior better, why it might be occurring. And then, um, you know, you know, un maybe understanding that, you know what, they're not just being willfully non-compliant. Um, you know, there's uh, something going on here that's related to their brain injury. And by understanding that, then hopefully we can be more effective in, in addressing whatever that behavioral issue might be. So, <clears throat> so one of the things that we want to do um, is, you know, let's say that we are, you know, performing some sort of task, um, you know, whatever that might be. So we're trying to get the child to do their homework or to clean up uh, a room or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, you know, we, we want to go into this sort of thinking about how can we prevent problems from happening. So, you know, whatever and to discuss or post rules, that kind of thing, behavior goals, what we want to see. Um, how this is involved in daily tasks, what the rewards will be. Um, we want to structure the task in, in, a, in a certain way. So for instance, um, we want to have a startup and closing routine. So, um, you know, sort of something that you say uh, when you are about to initiate whatever it is that you're going to do. So, okay, now we're going to start. Um, and then, okay, uh, looks like you've got it done. We're all finished. But just being sure that there's that, um, you know, intro and, uh, Closing routine it can be very helpful. You can set up check-ins and check-outs um, as well. So, uh, you know, check-ins uh, be sort of like you know, having the, uh, you know, checking in to be sure that the child is doing okay with whatever it is they're supposed to be doing. Um, 
the child can use checkout. So letting you know that they're going to go do something different, like they need to go to the restroom or whatever it might be. There are different things like that that can occur. Attention orienting techniques, we'll talk about those next. And using effective commands, uh, we'll talk about as well. So one thing that we know about children uh, with traumatic brain injury is, you know, there is oftentimes attention problems that occur. Um, and, you know, they, they, we may say something to a child, they may even acknowledge us or, you know, say, uh-huh, or whatever, and, um, but they really haven't processed what was happening. And so one way to um, address this issue is to, um, you know, to sort of gain their attention. You can do that with a physical prompt, sort of like, you know, like sometimes like a teacher will use like a flashing of the lights, uh, you know, turning on and off the lights in a classroom very quickly or something like that that alerts the children that something you know, important is about to happen or the teacher's about to say something. You can you know, clap your hands in a, a very specific way or snap your fingers, but something that will orient them to, to uh, their attention to you so that um, you can uh, you know, do whatever it is that you need to do, tell them whatever you need to tell them and, and have a better um, sense that they are actually focusing or attending to you. Sometimes if, you know, if the, uh, you know, they're getting off, off task or that kind of thing, you, you can use like little silly words uh, that will um, hopefully reorient their attention. So, you know, like freeze, you know, that kind of thing. And they'll sort of understand that they have to stop what they're doing, or you can have them, you can say something silly and have them echo that back to you. So broccoli taco, Marco Polo. So, um, you know, you would say that and then they would repeat it back. And once again, you kind of reoriented them and uh, hopefully refocus their attention. So, you know, giving uh, effective commands is also <clears throat> an important part of this. So once again, we use those key word activation of attending skills at orienting. So, you know, saying, you know, very specific, not a lot of words, but very specific about instructions, right? Uh, we're in that, we're, you're going to have to get instructions or directions or freeze or whatever it might be. Sometimes it might be helpful to establish physical contact. So for instance, putting a, putting a hand on the shoulder or that kind of thing or in the back to kind of um, be sure that they're focusing on you. Um, <clears throat> we definitely want to, uh, you know, shift the attention from attitude to compliance. So you're, you're really sort of the emphasis is placed on giving positive attention. Um, we're not really focusing, you know, if they do it, but they are, uh, I don't know, complaining or, um, you know, or whatever, groaning, sighing, what have you, that, that's okay, as long as they're doing it. That's what we're really focusing on. Um, sometimes if we if we cannot get the child to do something, you know, asking them the what we call compliance trial. So, you know, uh, getting them to uh, do something for you before you're uh, before you ask them to do anything, uh, do anything related to the task that you need to complete. So, for instance, it, like fetch commands. Um, so you could say, "Hey, could you go? Um, could you go get my uh, my calculator for me, or something like that?" Then the child brings you the calculator. Then you can go in immediately after that because you've established that compliance to whatever it is that you're asking them to do. Um, sometimes, you know, there can be like these little chain commands. Uh, so, you know, for instance, touch nose, uh, and just have the child touch their nose, clap hands, have the child clap their hands. And then once they've done that sort of simple um, compliance task, then you can go into something that is more specific to what you're working on. But you want to establish, if you need to establish that compliance first, then this is a way that you can do it and hopefully, um, you know, meet with less resistance um, afterward. So we'll talk a little bit more about differential attention here. Um, a very important technique. <clears throat> so, you know, basically with differential attention, what we want to do is we want to be sure that we're increasing the value of positive attention. Um, so we want to be sure that, you know, that, that the child is, um, you know, seeing the benefit or seeing the reward of, of uh, positive attention. We definitely want to, uh, to the greatest extent possible, we want to ignore minor misbehaviors. Um, you know, there might be some misbehaviors that we can't ignore, but for the most part, we're going to try to ignore, you know, the ones that are more minor, uh, might be irritating, but, you know, we're just going to let those go. Um, you can get positive attention to target behaviors. So um, you, let's say, 
sometimes a child may misbehave because, uh, you know, they're trying to, uh, they just want attention, you know, and it doesn't matter if the attention is positive or negative, as long as they have your attention, that's what they're looking for. Um, and so one way we can give them positive attention is by, um, you know, hopefully kind of just like joining with them, for instance, in a play activity. So, you know, you're, you're playing with the child and you're not really guiding, directing or anything, but you're just sort of reflecting or narrating what, um, what the child is doing. So, you know, I noticed that you put the, the green car over here in the garage and then, you know, whatever it is, you're just kind of, you're almost like a play by play kind of thing. You're providing very specific labeled praise. So, you know, I, I like the way that you, um, you know, you put that toy away when you were finished with it, um, that kind of thing. And then also you're kind of mimicking or matching the child behaviors. You're just kind of taking their lead and joining them in, in the play or the activity in that way. Um, once again, we want to shift the priority of commands to emphasize compliance, not positive attitude. Um, so we're going to reinforce compliance despite the manner in which the uh, uh, task was completed. So another type of differential attention is what we call the competing behavior model. And so this can be, this can be very useful, especially for very specific uh, problem behaviors. Uh, so, uh, you know, hitting, um, uh, maybe singing when they're not supposed to be singing or whatever, whatever the behavior might be. Um, we're going to try to replace that behavior with something that will compete with it. So something that the, if the child does the replacement behavior, then they cannot engage in the original problematic behavior. Um, the likelihood that a child will use a positive alternative behavior increases whenever that alternative provides the child some sort of control and is maybe easier or more efficient than the problem behavior. And we'll, we'll show a couple of examples of this. So here's an example of how this looks. So uh, the antecedent. So what's happening um, you know, at the time of the behavior problem? So the child is participating in a learning activity. So that's what's happening. What's the behavior? Um, the, the child is self-injurious. You know, maybe they're hitting themselves with their hand or that kind of thing. What kind of replacement behavior can we do? So we can reinforce clapping hands to replace the hitting, you know, the hitting of the self or that kind of thing. So we're going to reinforce that behavior. And then eventually the self-injurious behavior will, will decrease. Um, and so that's a, a very simple example of what a competing behavior model is. We just have to uh, you know, try to think of something that's going to replace, uh, effectively replace the, the problem behavior um, and begin to reward that. So here's, here's a case study uh, kind of using a competing behavior model. So uh, Kara is a teacher of a child with TBI. The child recently began to pinch his arms. She takes data on the behavior and discover that it functions uh, for attention. So whenever he pinches his arms, she comes over and tells him no pinching. And he's getting the desired attention that he wants. So the intervention here would be, Kara decided to implement an intervention that uses the differential reinforcement. So she taught him to sit with his hands intertwined on his desk. This is an incompatible behavior with pinching because he's not able to pinch while his hands are intertwined. She reinforces him for intertwining his hands, tells him, great job, or I like how you're sitting, and does not provide attention when he engages in the arm pinching. So once again, eventually, the goal is that that behavior, the arm pinching behavior, will um, decrease uh, over time and eventually uh, no longer be problematic. Here's another example. Carly is a parent of a child with TBI. When her child wants a break from homework, she reaches over and hits Carly's arm. Carly typically says, do you need a break now? Then she allows her to take a five minute break. Carly recognized that her child's intensity with hitting seemed to be increasing and she was worried she might get hurt. So using DRI, um, the intervention that Carly uh, design was putting a timer on the table within her child's reach and then teaching the child to touch the timer when she wanted a break. This is an incompatible behavior because the patient cannot simultaneously touch the timer and hit Carly. So when Carly's child touched the timer, she immediately received a break. 
When the child hit Carly, she did not receive a break. Uh, this was especially useful intervention because over time, Carly taught her child to set the timer on her own and become more independent with managing break times in that kind of thing. So once again, this is a simple example of you know, replacing a problematic behavior with a behavior that's more functional um, and uh, you know, less uh, uh, har harmful or uh, disruptive or what have you. So now we're going to talk a little bit. So though, what we just talked about there, that was sort of like you know basic behavior principles for targeting specific behaviors using reinforcement, uh, different types of reinforcement, um, differential attention, so paying attention to something, ignoring something else, and competing behaviors, so replacing a problem behavior with a more functional behavior, that kind of thing. And so all of those are extremely useful um, and can be very helpful for very specific problems. Um, can be very helpful for uh, uh, children in particular. And now we're going to sort of take a different approach or, or um, uh, look at another way to, to manage behavior. And this is going to be focused on, you know, really more on older children, adolescents, that kind of thing. And so here, what we're doing is um, it's a contextual antecedent focus model. So the previous model that we were talking about, the traditional model, um, we look at antecedents, behaviors, and consequences, but we're really sort of, you know, the, the consequences are sort of the, uh, um, the, the at the forefront of what we're thinking about there. Um, but here, what we're thinking about is we're really putting sort of more of the emphasis on trying to modify the antecedent events um, or what's, good, what, you know, what happens before the child demonstrates the problematic behavior. So here, <clears throat> um, you know, we definitely want to be um, mindful of when and how strategies are applied, and we want to, you know, uh, we want to do this carefully. So, for instance, an adolescent may respond very negatively or um, reluctantly, at least, to so, for instance, a token behavior reinforcement system. They may see it as childish, um, and you're you're already losing because they are just not going to engage in that because it, you know, it, it makes it, it seems silly and stupid to them. So, you know, we want to think about, well, what else, you know, what else can we do? And so, you know, one of the things we can do is we want to be aware of the context in which the child or adolescent is operating. So, um, you know, we want to, to sort of look at the bigger picture, so to speak, and, and, and use that information, hopefully, to guide um, our intervention in a way that is going to be more acceptable uh, to the adolescent and uh, hopefully more effective in actually um, promoting positive behavioral change. So for older children and adolescents, we want to be sure that our interventions avoid power struggles. It's so easy to get into a power struggle with an adolescent, for sure. We want to focus on antecedent conditions or sort of the context of, of where the behavior problems uh, occur. We want to provide positive support without creating learned helplessness. So, you know, we, we definitely want, you know, we want to provide support, but also helping the, the you know, the adolescent uh, learn to do some of these things on their own or independent. Um, <clears throat> we want to cultivate an environment that produces positive setting events. We'll talk about what those are. And then we want to help the adolescent develop and improve problem solving and greater independence. So that's really what we're talking about for older children, adolescents in particular. So let's take a look at this little, um, you know, little chart here. So this does a really good job of, of talking about um, setting events. So we have sort of, so thinking about the adolescent, there's internal states and external states. Um, so we want to be mindful of both. So what's happening inside um, and then what's kind of going on in the environment. Um, and so we have, you know, different uh, internal states would be physical. So now you know how the person's feeling, cognitive, um, you know, uh, how are they, uh, you know, are they focused with that kind of thing? Emotional, um, do they, you know, feel good about what they're doing? Meaning, does what they're doing have meaning or seem to be, you know, important to them, that kind of thing? External uh, setting events are sort of the presence or absence of preferred people. History of interaction. So, you know, what kind of uh, 
Um, what have the interactions looked like before that kind of thing? Environmental, so you know, is, is room comfortable? And then of course, time of day. You know, when is the when is the adolescent most likely to, um, you know, have the, you know, whatever type of uh, behavior is necessary to perform a certain task? You know, maybe they're better in the morning than the afternoon, or vice versa, that kind of thing. So those are all the setting events that we want to be aware of. So. Um, for physical, a positive setting event would be that the um, the adolescent feels rested, relaxed, they're satiated, so that means they've you know they've had something to eat, something to drink. Negative setting event would be that they're experiencing pain, they're sick, they're hungry, they're fatigued. Cognitive states, so uh, positive would be they're oriented to tasks, they're familiar with what's happening, they have adequate recall and recognition. Um, negative uh, cognitive setting event would be confused, frustrated, inadequate recall and recognition. Emotionally positive accomplishment, success, and achievement. Negatively anxiety, anger, depression, failure, meaning. So positively, the tasks are meaningful and accomplishable, so they can actually do it. Um, negative would be tasks are meaningless, infantilizing, or impossible, just too hard. So switching to the external states, so presence or absence of preferred people. So um, here we'd be prefer positively would be preferred people are present. So uh, that that's also important. Um, negative setting event would be absence of preferred people or presence of non-preferred people. Um, so maybe persons that the adolescent has had negative uh, interactions with uh, that kind of thing. What's the history of the interaction? So. Um, you know, there have been recent positive interactions with whoever the child is, um, you know, an adolescent is working with. Um, negative setting events where there's been recent conflict and disagreement. Environmental, um, appropriate and desirable environment, you know, whatever that means, um, you know, quiet, few distractions, uh, comfortable in terms of temperature, that kind of thing. Negative setting events would be a setting that's too loud, bright, noisy, distracting. And then finally, the time of day. What's the best time of the day? What's it? You know, we don't want to ask somebody to do something at the worst part of the day, especially if what we're asking them to do is a little more complicated or that kind of thing. And so, if we can be mindful of these setting events, um, both internally and externally, then we can hopefully start to think about how can we set up the context or the setting in which the child, the adolescent, is operating in to um, include more of these positive setting events. And if we do that then at the outset, we're going to prevent a lot of problems from happening in the first place because we have um, all of the supports that are necessary to, um, to um, help the adolescent experience success. So uh, positive behavioral momentum. So we know for sure motivation and compliance are challenges that parents and teachers, uh, you know, especially if older children and adolescents with brain injury deal with because their instructions, requests are met with resistance very often. So positive behavioral momentum here is, you know, it involves making a series of high probability requests followed by a difficult or low probability request. So this is kind of similar to what we were talking about earlier, um, where you know we are giving compliance commands, so like so, for instance, uh, you know, uh, touch nose or you know, go get, please go get my calculator, that kind of thing. Um, but once it, that same principle applies here, we're, we're going to ask them to do something that is more high probability, something we know they can do, something that they're not going to resist doing. And once they've done that thing, that you know, they've complied with that request, then we can start to move on with some more low probability requests um, because we've established that that compliance. So with positive behavioral momentum, we want to be sure that um, you know the individual becomes accustomed to responding to easy requests, thereby increasing the likelihood that she or he or she will comply with the more difficult ones. We know for sure when people are feeling good physically, feeling good about themselves, experiencing success on important tasks, they're better able to do challenging things. So we need to be mindful of that. And uh, you know, one way to establish positive behavioral momentum throughout the day for persons with brain injury is by having good daily routines. 
with a lot of effort devoted to positive setting events before the introduction of a more challenging or difficult task. So developing a routine is, you know, especially for adolescents, it's true for, I mean, all, all persons with brain injury, but, you know, thinking about adolescents here, um, routines are super important because they do, they do a lot of very useful things. So, oops, sorry. Um, we know for sure that a you know an adolescent with brain injury may have difficulty planning and organize their daily tasks. They just have a hard time you know putting all the pieces together to do what needs to happen. Um, and, you know to help with that, we can uh, plan a consistent routine at home and school that is predictable. So you know they're getting up at the same time each day, performing performing hygiene tasks in the same order, eating meals at the scheduled time, using checklists where necessary to help stay on task, etc. And basically, uh, a predictable daily routine helps the person with brain injury better anticipate, initiate, and complete daily activities. So they're more they're going to be more likely to get things done, um, and that's especially important when we are thinking about. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, creating those, you know, positive setting events uh, in which that daily routine is occurring as well. So when creating a daily routine, it's probably best to try to get the um, child or adolescent um, to participate in that. Uh, so you can engage them in creating a schedule, including all the activities that um, he or she might choose um, or be required to participate in during the day. Um, it's helpful to provide a preferred activity for every mandate, mandated or non-preferred activity. Once again, sort of thinking about that positive behavioral momentum. Um, and what this schedule does, or this, you know, what it helps to do is provide a sequence that guides the child and adolescent through activities without having to rely on reminders from parents or teachers. We're kind of developing that learned helplessness. You know, we're helping them learn to do things independently. Um, and uh, you know that will be a longer term uh, uh, strategy for success um, by helping them learn to do things on their own. Obviously, um, if you know, depending on the the child or adolescent, you know, sometimes it can be helpful if the routine is is picture based. So you could use pictures to represent, you know, homework, hygiene, whatever it might be. Um, you know, especially if there's some sort of issue with with reading or or that kind of thing. Uh, but you know, whatever works best for the child is fine as long as there's some sort of routine um, in place that they participated in, you know, uh, creating that routine themselves. So here's a you know a simple example of what a um, a routine could look like for a person with brain injury. So 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. shower, get dressed, eat breakfast. This is very sort of, you know, some people may need more detail in each one of these things so like maybe specific things in terms of what taking a shower involves and what getting dressed involves but you know this is kind of just the basics here um then from 8 to 10 a.m they have physical therapy 10 a.m to 12 p.m they have a zoom meeting with classmates to work on a history project 12 p.m to 2 p.m eat lunch do physical therapy home exercises two to four listen to music fold and put away laundry four to six help with and eat dinner with family six to eight chat with friends on Discord, play video games together, eight to 10, video games till 9.30, then get ready for bed, bedtime to 10. So just this kind of like a very sort of structured kind of routine uh, that will help, uh, you know, guide the adolescent through their day. Um, it puts less stress on them for having to kind of think about what they're going to do next or remembering what they have to do that's important. Um, and, uh, and, this really sort of helps them be more productive um, during the day and also less frustrated, which I think is equally important. After brain injury, especially in adolescence, there may be an increased need to exercise control because for so long, you know, they've been in environments where they didn't have a lot of control. So, you know, during hospitalization and rehabilitation, everything is kind of uh, dictated for them. Um, they, and they don't have a lot of control um, over the activities of their life. And um, so that need for control really kind of comes out, um, you know, later in their recovery. And this can result in um, power struggles uh, that can be very frustrating. 
And so one way we can deal with this is by beginning activities by giving the, the child or adolescent a set of choices. Um, you know, so you know, instead of saying, this is what you're gonna do, here are three things you can do, which one do you wanna do? Um, you know, that can really, that gives them that sense of, you know, they can make a choice, they have some control over that choice. That can be a really good way of, of ensuring that they are going to um, demonstrate the behavior, participate in the uh, behavior, whatever it might be, um, with less resistance. Um, and so an important thing here, we're not allowing the adolescent to dictate activities, um, but we're but we're routinely providing them choices about their participation within activity. So, um, you know, the three activities that we're offering are are all important and, and need to get done. Um, but the, the person gets to choose from from those activities in terms of what they're going to do. Actually. Some activities might may be non-negotiable. Um, and, you know, so we, they, you just can't negotiate, but it's, so it's good to have that conversation up front with the adolescent so that they know, they know this beforehand. So what activities might be non-negotiable? I just have a few here. There could be a variety of things, but for instance, going to school, non-negotiable, you got to go to school, um, riding the bus, you know, that's the only way you can get to school. You got to ride the bus. Um, you know, what time dinner is, uh, what time you're supposed to eat breakfast, that kind of thing. Um, Taking medicines, non-negotiable, right? If they're on an anti-epileptic medication, you can't skip it. You got to take it. It's non-negotiable. So you have these sort of, there shouldn't be too many of these things, right? We want just sort of a, a, a few core key non-negotiables non um, and that we want the adolescent to be aware of these. And then if we see resistance, um, you know, we can, uh, we can sort of point it out and sort of saying, um, you know, this is no choice, you know, there's no choice in this, this is something you have to do. Um, but, but if it's not something that they have to do, we can, you know, we can use the word choice. And so that way we're setting them up to know this is something I have to do, or this is something I can choose to do. And, and that could be helpful. And once again, this sort of prevents um, hopefully more significant problems or resistance from occurring. Even with good routines um, and strategies, an adolescent still may occasionally refuse to do what is expected. Um, so in this situation, it's good to have a script. So, you know, you can remind the adolescent that they're refusing to do their own plan. Like, look, you put this plan together. This is something you decided that you wanted to do. Um, it's not me telling you what you have to, you chose. And, and so you're, you know, just let them know that you're, you're refusing to do what you said you wanted to do. Um, you can invite the child to change an aspect of the plan. So, um, you know, if there's something, you know, specific, you know, maybe there's something that can be modified just a little bit and uh, we'll get, and we'll help get past the impasse or the refusal. Um, if they continue to refuse, invite the child um, uh, to let caregivers or teachers know when he's ready to resume his plan. And so really just kind of letting them sort of check out there um, because with continued refusal, if we continue to, uh, you know, meet that refusal with, um, you know, frustration or more demands, and it usually just ends up in a bad situation. Um, let's see. So, yeah, and so it, we're not saying that we, sometimes, you know, the best thing to do is, is nothing, right? So you want to, you, you don't want to continue to escalate the problem. Um, and so giving the, giving the uh, adolescent sort of an escape, uh, you know, a word or something they can use to, to get out of that for whatever amount of time is, is okay to do, for sure. Better than the alternative. We also want to be aware that um, persons with brain injury are very um, prone to being overwhelmed or overloaded um, as a result of cognitive and emotional difficulties after the brain injury. Triggers for becoming overloaded might include, you know, having to do more complicated tasks, lots of materials, new things that, uh, that they don't have experience with, things that are complex, um, can all be very frustrating and overwhelming. Settings, certain settings can be overwhelming, so large numbers of people, high social demands, adjustment to new and unusual demands can also be overloading. And so whenever the child is overloaded, um, they're more likely to misbehave. So once again, it kind of gets into the setting events, sort of thinking about that, but just being aware that, you know, certain types of tasks and situations may um, really overstimulate or overload the person with brain injury. And so kind of getting back to the, um, 
you know, teaching escape communication is right here. So, um, you know, sometimes this misbehavior is, uh, is just a reflection of the need to escape. Um, escape communication is a way to create a positive alternative to misbehavior by teaching the child or adolescent a simple word or phrase to communicate. So break, time out, I'm done, I'm finished. Um, we use these with um, our patients on the inpatient rehabilitation unit very frequently. Um, you know, they do a lot of therapy all day. Um, sometimes they just get overwhelmed, tired, fatigued, or whatever. And, you know, giving them a key word or, or phrase that they can use um, to just, you know, take a moment, take a, take a few minutes uh, can be really helpful. And it prevents the problem from escalating um, and creating a bigger issue. So uh, here's a, a, a way of preventing behavior problems by teaching a, a good problem solving routine. So sort of a case study here. Maddie is a 12 year old girl with a brain injury. She keeps a messy room. Maddie's parents ask her to clean her room and check in with her after 15 minutes to see how she's doing. They find her sitting in her room, looking at her phone. She's made no headway, hasn't done a thing. Her parents are frustrated that she hasn't even started cleaning her room yet. Maddie reacts to the frustration with a disproportionate proportion and emotional response. So, you know, she gets really upset. So the assumption would be you're looking at that behavior. It may seem that Maddie is non-compliant, stubborn, un unmotivated, or just lazy. But the reality is because of her brain injury, Maddie has difficulty with initiation. She's not resisting the task necessarily, but it's having difficulty getting started. She also has difficulty with planning and organizing due to her brain injury and the demands of cleaning her room are overwhelming and frustrating. So by understanding the underlying reason for her not keeping her room clean, her parents can work with her to develop a problem solving recipe or routine to help complete that task more effectively. And here's a great example of a, of a problem solving routine. Um, it's a goal plan do review. This is from Mark Filbesacher, um, a great rehabilitation um, researcher. And basically, you know, you just kind of have a, a you know, goal. What am I trying to accomplish? plan, how am I going to accomplish my plan, what are the materials I need, what are the steps involved. Um, you can also do a prediction to kind of increase awareness, how well do I think I'm going to do, and a parent or a teacher can also rate how well they think the person is going to do. Then once you have all that together, you can actually implement the plan. Um, even with good plans, as we've already said, sometimes there could be problems, so how do we go about addressing the problems, what are some solutions, should I ask for help, um, you know, whatever it might be. Then at the end, this is something that's easy to forget, but it's really important. Um, review, how did I do? You can do a self-rating again. Um, and uh, and then you know, a, a teacher or parent could also do a self-rating at the end. And then most importantly, um, at, the, at the end of the task, what worked, what didn't work, and what will I try next time? And so basically by doing this, you're, in, you're developing a mental template of how to go about a problem-solving activity um, in a very strategic and planful kind of way. Um, and with repetition, the idea is that this approach will become internalized and uh, the adolescent will be able to do this independently um, at some point in the future. So here's just sort of an example of what that looks like. So this simple uh, cleaning my room in 15 minutes, material, uh, so you're gonna ask, uh, how am I going to accomplish my task? Materials, I'm gonna uh, trash can or bag for throwing away trash, box or basket for things that don't belong in the room, steps, put dirty clothing in hamper, put trash in trash can, make bed, refold, um, rehang clo clean clothes, pick up all the toys, identify items that don't belong in the room, place them in a basket or box to remove. So you implement it, there's a problem, not sure where something goes, what's the solution, well, I can ask mom or dad. What worked, the room was clean. What didn't work, oops, I forgot to check under the bed. Um, what will I do differently next time? I'll remember to check under my bed and maybe include this as a separate step in my plan. So this is sort of a simple example of how this can look in a real world sort of situation. So at the very end here, I just want to quickly go over um, a program called Teen Online Problem Solving um, that we offer at Tier Memorial Herman. Um, it's for adolescents with brain injury. And uh, basically, it's a, pro a problem solving program for families to address challenges experienced after a, a an adolescent has a brain injury. Um, participating in the program helps the child and their family learn about the effects of brain injury, build skills, and use strategies to help everyone cope more effectively. Um, and uh, 
its uh, requirements, the, the adolescent needs to be between 13 and 19. There are 10 sessions. Each session lasts about an hour. So you do like, for instance, one a week, a parent or guardian or you know, is, is uh, asked to participate as well. Uh, technology requirements, a computer with a webcam um, and camera and internet, internet access are needed. Um, and so we're offering this program at tier. Um, it, it can be done online, sort of self-guided. So we th there's been research done with the program, and it's shown that doing the program completely online, self-guided, so just a child and a parent, um, or, you know, caregiver doing the activities together each week is just as effective as actually doing this in person with a therapist. So uh, just important to note. And uh, and this can be done uh, for free uh, by uh, contacting me at my email address or phone here, and I'd be happy to, to send a link um, to you or whoever you know who might benefit from this type of program. It's, it's very user-friendly, it's uh, engaging, it's designed specifically for adolescents, so um, you know, it's computer-based, so things that are appealing to adolescents uh, these days, And but you know, most important is they're actually learning a lot about brain injury and a lot of strategies um, to help with issues or difficulties that adolescents with brain injury frequently um, have to deal with. All right, so here's some behavioral objectives. So um, for the uh, few minutes that we have left here, uh, I was going to open it up to see if anybody has any questions.